Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Tracy Alloway. And I'm Joe Weisenthal. Joe, have you ever heard of something called the Tablet of A. Nasser? I'm going to mispronounce that because my ancient Mesopotamian isn't up to scratch, but the Tablet of A. Nasser. No, never. This became like a big internet meme. There were lots of jokes about it, but it was basically this uh, tablet, this old Mesopotamian tablet. I think it was like 4,000 years old with cuneiform written on it. And it some people sometimes talk about it as the world's oldest business complaint. You know, not only have I never heard of this tablet, I'm actually struggling to like figure out what the next thing you're going to say is that connects it to this Sorry. episode that's coming up. This is the most random uh, intro to well, one I'm, of our I, episodes I like, I, like, I like this one. I like where you're going. I'm, try I'm trying to bring the historic context. But OK, so written on this tablet was a business complaint against this guy, A. Nasser, who was a copper trader in ancient Mesopotamia. And his customer had written a complaint basically saying, you promised me a certain amount and type of copper, you gave me lesser ah. quality copper, and I'm upset, and you have to do something about it. So I get, this is, okay, now I get how this makes sense, and I guess this is like a phenomenon throughout history, that if you're buying actual physical stuff, there is a question of, you enter into a contract, did you actually get the stuff? Is the, right. stuff, that the stuff that the person said they were going to give you, is it actually... Uh, what it is. Is it real? That's exactly it. And how do you check beforehand to see whether or not the stuff that you're going to be getting is the stuff that was promised to you? These are ancient, ancient problems. And the weird thing is, it seems like the commodities world hasn't actually progressed that much from cuneiform tablets written yeah. on stone to what we use today, which is mostly paperwork. I remember an episode we did with Dan Davies several years ago, and we talked about the uh, the salad oil scandal, right. the famous one where the guy like filled up those tanks filled with water and then put a thin layer of oil and they came and they checked and they're like, oh, these tanks are oil and he was able to borrow against them. Right. Was, uh, Warren Buffett made a bunch in the crash of all the entities that were associated with it. But this stuff always fascinates me because I think these are the stories where the lot the there's something different between just the lines we see on a chart. Which totally. Are these abstracted versions of, of commodities versus like the actual handling of the real thing. Right. There's the financialized commodity, the yeah. line that you see on an electronic screen, and then the actual commodity. The two are supposed to match or relate right. in one way or thing. another, but they're definitely not the same thing. And recently, one of the reasons we wanted to do this episode is there have been a series of scandals in commodities land that have to do with collateral management. So the big one that springs to mind is LME discovering mm -hmm. that it had a bunch of rocks instead of nickel uh, backing some of its contracts. And this kind of was a major talking point in commodities world. This is just so fascinating. And that involves like heists and scams and deceptions totally. and fraud. And it's just, as you say, it's throughout history. So I'd love to learn more about how this business works. Yeah. Why does the commodities world seem so sort of ripe for these types yeah. of scandals? And uh, I'm very pleased to say that we have truly the perfect guest. We are going to be speaking uh, with multi-time Odd Lots uh, guests at the moment. Um, Mercury Group CEO Anton Posner and Mercury Group COO Margot Brock. Thank you so much for coming back on Odd Lots. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank you. Great to be here again. So the last time we talked, I think we were talking about the, the barge business and mm. what was going on in the Mississippi River. But walk us through your approach to collateral management, because this is a space that you play in. I think you do some business for, for mm -hmm. major players, such as the big banks. But what exactly do you guys do in the field of collateral management? First, I'd just like to say also that cuneiform uh, reference you made, they're still fighting it out in court in Athens. Uh, their errors are still, has not been resolved, uh, so it's still going on. Uh, well, we can point. litigate it right now. Yeah, uh, exactly. It's <laughs> continuing. So, yeah, that's why I have cuneiform uh, um, keyboard on my uh, on my iPhone. Um, so uh, what we do, we, we as you mentioned, we work for, for several uh, major banks that are involved in physical commodity uh, finance and trade, in addition to trading companies and producers on, and uh, commodities with a, um, a certainly a strong uh, focus on metals and steel and raw materials that go along with it. On the collateral management uh, front, we uh, we perform uh, audits and inspections at facilities uh, for 
banks and financiers that are financing physical commodities to do uh, some addition, some initial uh, vetting work, uh, finding out the procedures, uh, diving into uh, the um, everything from the ownership and the procedures and the personnel that are involved in issuance of documentation to who's going to be the primary point of communication, how are they keeping track of who owns what and so forth. That uh, is the, pre, the work that's done uh, preliminary ahead of a finance deal. And then once there are physical commodities in place, we're doing uh, jobs like uh, having auditors go out and count physical metal, counting um, bundles of aluminum ingots in warehouse for uh, for banks uh, to verify what's there, and even to the point where we have, through our subcontractor partners, uh, flying drones to measure huh. the height uh, mm. and angle of repose of stockpiles of coal, for example, to verify approximately how many tons are in the stockpile for banks that are financing uh, um, dry bulk commodities like that. Hmm. I have a question. Before we get into like the various frauds and deceptions, why don't we take like a very sort of simple, uh, sort of vanilla instance of how a trade would work? Like, suppose Tracy has a bunch of oil and she wants to um, uh, pledge it, borrow some money from me, and I would need to make sure that she actually has the oil. Like, what's, wait, can like, we do coal instead? Or coal, because I do you, actually oh, yeah. have some coal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, Tracy the oil is, is the old story, yeah, right? right. That's the old story. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Tracy is coal. She doesn't want. She wants to borrow against it, get some mm -hmm. liquidity for it. I say, yeah, I want to. I'm happy to lend against your coal, Tracy, but I need some proof that it's mm -hmm. there. She goes to you. What's like the basic steps of the process? What do you produce for me? Sure. The you know initially, and and we work with our clients, with our bank and uh, trading clients to determine what level uh, they want to go down, how far they want to go down the rabbit hole in terms of analyzing. Oh, okay. it's, I mean, it could, could be to the point of sending a surveyor out, uh, taking samples, sending it to a pre-agreed uh, laboratory that uh, has expertise in that particular commodity to verify the quality uh, that's there. Of course, the quantity inspection is, is important, right? Verifying uh, that uh, the quantity matches what Tracy's declaring right. to the bank or the financier. So verifying the quality, the, the volume, and then also verifying uh, and working to ensure that the facility that it's being stored at Tracy's house in uh, Connecticut uh, may not may not pass muster in terms of a <laughs> secure collateral. I will uh, say there location. are a lot of squirrels that have made exactly, nests within right. the coal pile. Exactly. Exactly. The, the yeah. biomass that's mixed in. Exactly. Right. So so ensuring uh, that it right. And we have clients that sometimes don't want us to go that deep. Mm. Uh, sometimes it's just volume, but we're not taking samples for qualities and, and so forth. So so we're our initial uh, our initial approach with a one of our clients that hire us for collateral management services is determining how far how far down they want to go. I was going to ask how much of this depends on the sample size because it seems like an easy thing for me to do mm -hmm. if I was worried about the quality of my coal is I don't know I would get a really nice piece of anthracite from somewhere else and say here here's a sample of my coal. Sure. Yeah. Well, most importantly, if you're going to draw samples, it's going to be randomized. Mm. And you're going to have a certain percentage of the cargo that has to be sampled. If it's a quite a large stockpile of coal, you know, you're going to want a lot of representative samples from different sides, different angles, top, bottoms, and quite so people can't pick the most attractive attractive piece of anthracite to put right. out there. So it really does depend on the parcel size that you're talking about. The, I mean... You've just laid out how it's supposed to go in theory, and yet what we've seen recently is numerous examples of people fooling the auditors, people fooling the inspectors, sometimes in kind of amusing ways with painted rocks mm -hmm. and things like that. So what's going on there? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of opportunity for fraud at all levels, at all all the facets, right, That uh, of this process. Um, as you said, going back, uh, you know, to uh, the uh, Phoenicians, right, and their and their complaints. So there's no uh, nothing's nothing much has changed except the methods of which uh, communication uh, has. But um, you know, the things that could go wrong, where you had the the recent Trafagora mess uh, there with their thousand containers of uh, what appears to be steel discs or fake. Uh, you know, nickel in that case. And then there was other other examples. Um, 
the uh, Hin Leong uh, scandal in uh, mm-hmm. Singapore, for example, where you had um, the warehouseman that was storing the uh, the petroleum oil in this case was issuing um, issuing documentation to multiple financiers for the same exact stock. So you had a that's a situation where it wasn't the supplier that was the problem, but rather the facility that was doing the storage, which which has been a problem. Well, so I was going to ask, and I, I, it's this sort of perfect what your answer because I was going to add on to Tracy's. Like, how mu- do co- do entities become vulnerable when they work with the same counterparties over and over again and mm. just sort of like mm. drop their guard? Essentially, it's like, oh, this sure. is the way we've always done it. This is the way we've always done it, and then someone figures out how to enter into that relationship that's existed for a long time. Like maybe the first time mm-hmm. Tracy pledges are called to me, like I do a big inspection, but by the 10th time, like, yeah, I know you're good for it. But is that when Absolutely. fraud starts? Absolutely. Because you get complacent and you let your guard down like anything else in life. So these longstanding relationships that have always just run on autopilot and uh, someday some guy has a great idea of how he's going to fool the system and make money. So yeah, I think you, you have to keep the guard up. You have yeah. to have your checks and balances in place from the beginning of that relationship straight through to the end. That's why they exist. Once you drop your checks and balances, that's when you you stop right. being accountable. You stop you know mm. looking at what you have. So here's a really basic question because I I you know we all read a little bit about the Trafigura and LME scandal, mm. um, but everyone was focused on those very big names for obvious reasons. But what happened to the alleged fraudster mm. do do they just disappear with the money i, I imagine their business um, of commodity shipping and producing is is pretty moot at that point right yeah the, the producer in uh, in india on the on the nickel situation i'm sure is uh, untouchable at this point in terms of uh, ability to to transact uh, with other anyone else really at, at this point right. um, but tra- he also but he also got half a billion dollars so <laughs> oh, he's wow. fine yeah he's fine <laughs> is there, there's yeah. no like real obvious recourse against it? traffickers pursuing. I mean, you know, we, we don't certainly don't know the yeah. ins and outs of traffickers. Right? Sure. We're not we're not involved in that, so to be clear on that, right? So we're we're reading what uh, transpired, you know, from news reports, right? But uh, we, you know, it looks like they're pursuing legal avenues to uh, to you know to go after them, but that's going to be long and drawn out, right? And just to be clear on nickel, and I think this is something, you know. Terry Duffy, when we talked to him, he's like, there's something mm-hmm. about nickel. It's that it's in bags, right? Like some metal is like stacked. You see it. And so everything, what would be uh, an ideal form of auditing? I can't imagine um, like you open every bag, oh, but like what is, but what are o- best opening practices? some bags. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Again, it becomes that randomized yeah. audit, that randomized sampling. And Got you it. do have to, you mm. have to look and you have to go in and say, let's, you know, it's all stacked in the warehouse. Let's right. break some down. Let's pull it out. And let's just, at a minimum, open the top of the bags and look in. Mm-hmm. And also, I was going to say, too, nickel is a much more higher value uh, metal versus uh, aluminum, let's uh-huh. say, or zinc. So uh, it's like counterfeiting. If you're going to counterfeit uh, bills, you're going to probably counterfeit. Uh, if you're taking the time to do it, you're going to be doing $100 bills, right, rather than focusing on counterfeiting $100 bills. Right. So right. Nickel. Oh, so... In bags, high value, high value. Right. big uh, honeypot. Mm-hmm. And there's really been two different types of fraud on it. And okay. one is the Indian one that Trafagora is involved in is, a sh- is during shipment. So by the time mm-hmm. it lands where it's headed, the last containers are already afloat and everything, all the documents are presented and everyone's been paid. Mm. So they haven't had the opportunity to open doors on that very first container that's shipped to even look and find their fraud. So that fraud, you have to really concentrate on combating at load. And then there's the fraud of the rocks that were in the nickel bags. And that was in warehouse for years and years. Mm. But again, nobody nobody opened up the bags there. So there's, Mm. you know, like Anton said, it's a system as old as time. And there's so many points within that system where fraud can happen and theft happens and the opportunities present themselves. So just on this note, I mean, my impression is that one of the issues here and one of the reasons why the commodities world is susceptible to this type of fraud is, you know, not just that you can fake uh, nickel by using some rocks put in a bag, 
but also so much of it relies on paperwork mm -hmm. and you know invoices and trade receivables and things right. like that. Can you talk a little bit about why that is and how endemic it is in your line of business? Sure. On the paper, uh, referring to the paperwork side, right? Uh, paperwork, the documents that go along with a shipment are fairly easy to to forge, right? Uh, so the quality certificates that went along with that nickel coming out of India or uh, the the paperwork. Let, let's take the uh, Henley Ong situation in Singapore, yeah. right? The documentation, the warehouse receipts, the holding certificates that went to the to the banks to show that uh, that there was ownership, right? Uh, can are just printed off uh, off a computer, signed and stamped. It's fairly easy to to make these documents and send them along. So it's the doc. The paperwork is only as good as the counterparty that's uh, that's drawing it up. So it's uh, the old. Um, trust but verify, right? Uh, premise, uh, as Margot said, right? Uh, you taking representative samples, not just you know the paperwork. Really, um, really is to go along with it, but it has to be part of a part of the bigger process, right? right. Mm -hmm. So obviously, one way of fighting fraud is, as you say, go in the bags, mm -hmm. rip open a bunch, uh, do samples. The other way to engage in fraud that you've sort of hinted at but haven't talked about as much mm -hmm. is. Tracy comes to me, asks for uh, money against her uh, call, but also does it for like six or seven um, entities right. over and over pledges it. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the checks that uh, uh, that you do or yeah. that uh, a party should do to avoid or prevent uh, multiple pledged collateral? Yeah. And this is a it's a tougher one. Yeah. Because let's go back to the uh, to the Qingdao uh, scandal in, in China uh, 10 plus years ago, I believe, uh, where the Western warehousing companies, uh, LME warehousing companies, uh, in China doesn't have London Metal Exchange warehouses. So these are the same companies that had subcontracted warehouses in Qingdao storing copper and other metals. And the the warehousemen there, there was a couple of warehouses in Qingdao that were subcontracted by the by the um, by the LME warehousing companies, to, and they were in in cahoots with some of the local traders there to double, triple, quadruple pledge the mm. stocks of copper to multiple banks. So they'd say, All right, you got a 10,000 tons of copper mm. cathode sitting in there. And uh, the the local warehouseman uh, got that warehouse, uh, was issuing warehouse receipt to multiple multiple banks and financing entities for that same stack of copper, unbeknownst to the warehousing company that was contracting uh, contracting with them so they thought um, they thought that they you know, the Western warehousing companies or the large LME warehousing companies thought that they were uh, that uh, the their Chinese subcontractor was doing the right thing and being honorable but was really hmm. handing out paper left and right, hmm. right for the same stack of metal. And I would say if Joe is looking to finance Tracy's coal yeah you don't want to do it on Tracy's property. Because Tracy retains retains control of it. Oh, like oh we would want to move it be to a third yeah, party. Yeah. It's going to be uh, step number one. I want your coal somewhere where I have a mm -hmm. trusted third party mm. controlling it and hopefully issuing right. only one warehouse receipt on it. Oh, so it would be the warehouse. So in the process of getting that confirmation, it would be the warehouse sort of vouching for it. And then yes. it would be on them. It would be on the warehouse like would be the one breaking the law or being complicit in breaking the law yeah. if they were sending it out to right. multiple Which entities. is what happened in Qingdao. Got it, got it. And yeah. Mar Margo brings up a really good point. And, and often we've had multiple conversations over the years about providing collateral management services for stock retained at a customer's uh, or at a at a facility that's controlled by the entity that's getting that's benefiting from the financing, right? So, as Margo said, with that's always a more complicated uh, collateral management approach. Then you have to have regular inspections, verify that when the inspector is not there, is that material being taken being being taken out, right? We were we did a um, a similar uh, project for. Uh, inbound steel slab going into a rolling mill uh, in Ohio. This and uh, the the bank that we were working for on that one was financing the steel slab, but it was on the property of the rolling mill. And then the bank would would have possession uh, of the slab, but also the coils, steel coils that were rolled from that slab afterward. That meant we had to send in 
it's Mercury or a predecessor, predecessor company we had to send in inspectors regularly to verify what was there. Did they did the mill take more slabs than they were supposed to from the stock that was that was dedicated to that particular yeah. bank? And in one case, Margo uncovered an uh, interesting situation. I yes. found, yes. I found you. fraud. Yeah, and it's a good one. It was only detected simply because we were working on behalf of both banks that were financing huh. the slab and the ultimate hot rolled coil that were coming out of the slab. So at the end of each day, there was a pledge list of you know, we've we've removed this much slab from your inventory by, you know, specific piece number. Yeah. And to balance out the value, you ha now have this stack of coils, and these are the numbers of your coils. And this happened on a daily basis, and all those reports came to us. And basically, it was a simple overlay of reports. Hmm. And we started identifying coils that were double pledged. Oh. Sorry, explain that an overlay of reports. What does that mean? Just taking both inventory reports, both daily declarations to each of. The each of the banks oh. and doing them side so by side to look and start realizing that we had a handful of coils that were pledged to both banks. So out of curiosity, how much was that slab and the coils worth? And the reason I ask is because this seems like a lot of work and very mm -hmm. granular. High risk. Right. Granular, high risk. And I kind of wonder... I wonder about the incentive structure here if there are commodities dealers out there who basically say, this is a risk we're willing to take. We're going to find someone, you know, a warehouse or whoever with the least amount of paperwork, mm -hmm. the least bureaucratic process to go through because this all seems like quite a lot. Yeah. It, this, it, it will, the, the value of the slabs is a few hundred bucks a ton. And then they were, when they were rolled into coils, it were added value at that point. So you know, add on another hundred bucks a ton. I'm certainly not a steel pricing expert. Expert, right? But um, but that was uh, just just to give you approximate value. But you know, Tracy, we're seeing um, just to, on your question, right? We're seeing banks that uh, bailed out of commodity trade finance because of these problems. ABN yeah. Amro, BMP Paribas, a couple of years ago, uh, announced that they were getting out of a lot, uh, pretty some significant uh, portion of their physical commodity trade. It's left a smaller group of trader of banks that are willing to get involved uh, in this at this point, which has opened up the door to some of the some of the less scrupulous ones. Take the green sill disaster, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Using the oh, yeah, disaster the, there. Yeah, because I don't think of that in the same category. So yeah, different well, how, category. Yeah, right? So how does green sill fit into this story? And green sill pretty basic. It, uh, boil, it boils down for the most part to uh, an entity, green sill capital, that uh, that was too close with one of the steel steel producers, mm. they were financing trades uh, that were that involved the steel producer, the bank that the steel producer owned was was heavily involved in, uh, in it was that. trade receivables, right? It was trade receivables. Yeah. And on but and also future sales. Oh, yeah. oh right. Yeah. Yes. So Which inflating is, their oh. future sales and, right, and borrowing and you don't against even them. have anything to secure that sale. Right. So. Okay. And fake invoices that were presented to oh. Greensill to finance and Greensill was backed by Credit Suisse and we know where Credit Suisse is at these days. So none of this worked out well for the number for of rates Credit, Credit Suisse stepped on over the years. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, this was one of uh, you know ma massive, uh, you know, massive strike against uh, against the bank, and of course now look where they are, right? And it's merged into UBS. But um, you know, this was a situation as Marco mentioned, the, the future receivables, which was never made clear to Credit Suisse and their investors in the funds that were backing Greensill that they were. They weren't financing physical sales. They were financing theoretical right. sales. I mean, when you you read what transpired there, you 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 know, I think uh, you know, my our teenage kids could have figured out that this was a bad deal. So if, uh, it's one thing to be a future receivable, and a future sale may one day become a receivable, mm -hmm. but it's clearly not the same thing right. by any stretch. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, yeah. You mentioned the banks have gotten out of this business. So mm. this is not just like – that's interesting to me because that implies it's not just the occasional idiosyncratic mm -hmm. thing that pops up on the news and becomes a scandal that we talk about once every two right. years, that it must be like a big enough challenge for the industry that some banks are like, this is not worth right. it. Can you talk about like how big are we talking about here? Mm. 
Yeah, well, we've seen you know with EB and Amaro and BNP Paribas getting out. They were two major two banks that were major had a major presence in the physical commodity uh, physical commodity trade. So it's left um, the banks uh, that are that are left in, in it. Uh, you have ING, uh, Rabobank, uh, Brown Brothers Harriman here in New York, of course, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, and so forth. But it's left a dwindling number of banks that have the appetite for getting uh, getting in, involved in uh, physical commodity uh, trade finance in mm. uh, in this way um, look at what happened with on the Trafigura part of this part of the story and certainly again no, not an expert in, in exactly what happened but Citibank bailed out of financing those nickel trades with that particular supplier I think it was about a year before maybe f uh, before the the problem became uh, became evident so there was must have been some red flags that were hmm. that were coming up and city was uh, was keen enough to be able to extract themselves from that uh, prior that left Trafigura, uh, in a situation where we saw they they went to non some non traditional secondary finance entities mm. to to mitigate their risk, they weren't using their own money for purchasing that nickel. They were using hmm. tr trade finance trade finance company money that that uh, ended up getting caught up in the uh, in the mess at this point too. So it leads to the question of if a major company like Trafigura can't get bank level interest rates to finance this and they're going to the secondary lenders right that are much higher cost well, why right why? well i've <laughs> seen some people draw a not very subtle connection between like okay the regulators put in additional rules around trade financing because it's a risky business yeah. for mm -hmm. the banks mm -hmm. uh, so a bunch of banks pulled out now you have a smaller body of players um some of varying qualities and this might be one reason why we're seeing more scandals, because you don't have as much credit, you don't have as big an ecosystem mm -hmm. as you did previously. Mm -hmm. Is there any truth to that claim? Yeah, I, yeah. The the uh, certainly without with less lenders and less participants in the in the field, right? It's it's concentrated that risk into a smaller group mm. of uh, of entities that are willing the banks the financiers that are uh, that are doing this type of uh, this type of business so yeah I think that there's some credence uh, credence to that but it ultimately goes back still to the, to the quality right if we're talking about financing aluminum coming out of an Alcoa smelter it's not quite the same as what Trafigura got uh, got hooked right. into, or the problems with the uh, you know fake uh, copper uh, painted bricks and yeah. so forth. This was not you know, this metal was not coming out of a out of uh, you know an Alcoa Rio Tinto level of producer and counterparty. So the minute you're going getting involved in entities that are that may not have um, quite the level of reputation as these major yeah. major producers have, you need to start ramping up. Your level of collateral management and oversight and uh, and risk risk management and I think that's that's really where the problem is where we see regularly not not that desire to go as far as they need to. Mm -hmm. uh, can we talk about gold? The internet loves the occasional story about gold theories, like oh, all the gold, gold conspiracy yeah, gold, theories. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, <laughs> uh, all the gold that's in Fort Knox is actually a brick and is painted. No one has inspected it in fifty years. You know, you just like see this constantly, constantly. Mm -hmm. what, uh, people are like, oh, well, how should people like? What kind of regular inspections are there? Is, a? Is there gold? Uh, is there gold fraud? Is that a thing that exists in terms of this is not gold or something painted or mm -hmm. that someone moved it out and no one's checked the warehouse? And uh, how is uh, gold inspected? Yeah, uh, gold gold is not something that we get involved. We don't get okay. involved in precious metals. So caveat um, with that. Uh, that being said, uh, one of our friends, uh, Marlon, right? Uh, thinking of. Um, that they're one of the inspection companies that we that we work closely with. Um, uh, they have they fly somebody down to the Cayman Islands every once in a while to go into the bank uh, vaults and uh, check out. Uh, it sounds the like a nice job. Piles. Just Doesn't throwing it? that out. I <laughs> thought that was I, fantastic. I could do too. tons of flying. Yeah, yeah. Yes, he loves the Cayman. I love Cayman. Islands. I just want to say I've never admitted this before. Uh, I was I did this field trip. I um, thought you were going to say you're a gold bug. No, <laughs> I, I did this field trip to the New York Fed when I was mm -hmm. in um, in high school, and 
uh, they brought us down to the gold vault and mm -hmm. it was pretty cool. And they showed us how like often, like when one entity, like the IMF, like sells gold to another I entity, it like, the gold is put on a, uh, uh, like a- Yeah, what is pallets? Yeah, right pallets, they, they just wheel it over around, to someone yeah. else's locker. But anyway, I was like standing next to the gold and I like sort of scratched a little <laughs> bit of it myself and a couple pieces of dust like fell and I like sort of freaked out. But there <laughs> and was, then like, he put it in his pocket? Uh, no, it did, it did <laughs> went on the floor, but I was like, oh, like that gold is- That like, must oh. be a federal crime yeah, that was, like, just it, admitted yeah, to yeah, on yeah. air. I was just like- <laughs> Statue of limitations has expired. This is true, this is true. A few little pieces of dust fell through and I sort of got freaked out that that was even possible. So somewhere- there was a gold ingot with just like a little, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah. It, it, statue it, of limitations. Yeah. I was freaked out. I didn't it's, take anything. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. They, we see them pulling right, yeah. in the movies, right? Pulling pulling the gold around in these big pallets with these uh, pulleys. And you know, so I think it, um, and not to dive too deep into gold because sure. it's not our area of expertise, right? But same principles, right? If you're flying down to the Cayman Islands and you're going to inspect gold um, and, and this story, um, in this particular case, one of the major global banks that was financing the gold there in a vault in the, in the Caymans. I'm just I'm not sure what level of um, how far they took they went yeah. as far as taking samples and setting it to a lab for analysis and so forth, or if it was just a simple counting. But when you get into a simple counting of gold bars, then you're just counting them. You're not verifying that they're actually gold, and you might end up with something you know that like is on that table over there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what is on the table? Is, oh, you, yeah. brought, uh, you brought props. props. Yeah, I thought we were going to, yeah. What is, so we. <laughs> exactly. What is, uh, what, what, what is our takeaway from this prop? Yeah. Uh, the takeaway is that I can count that as one, but it doesn't mean that it's one bar of gold, one right. brick of gold, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. just doing a count um, and is, is only, only one step. Well, actually, you brought a couple yeah. more, and so I guess part of the story could be you sample this one and this one, <laughs> but not that but one. That, right. But not right. that one. Like, how common right. is stuff like that? Because that actually is not that different from even conceptually the salad mm -hmm. oil scandal, right? right? Which mm -hmm. is like you have this layer of something legitimate. So, talk to us a little bit about like just sort of like the way some of this can get concealed if like the you know the top layer or something like that is uh, well, legit in the inside. Kind of yeah. exactly what you said. You make those outer layers look to be the right material. Yeah. And then it's the onus is on someone to be responsible and look inside, right? Yeah. Look inside that stack and see is it what you think it is all the way through. Right. And again, that's mm -hmm. just like I said, you know, early on you talked about the nickel and maybe you do have to get into the warehouse and occasionally say, I want that lot there broken down and pull out all of them and I want to look inside the bags in the middle. Don't forget that about the middle. That's where we all, you know, it's like the middle of the it's mashed potatoes stuff. where I'm you hid your vegetables as a kid. I'm envisioning like a movie in which someone is convinced there's a fraud and just goes through this like and just tearing up bag after bag and still like they're all the While they slowly like, go insane. And then they slowly yeah. go insane. Yeah. They know there's fraud and they fucking mm -hmm. know. They finally yeah. get carted out. And for then. the <laughs> warehouseman has the right to charge for uh, for the labor and time yeah. right, to move all that stuff. So you know, warehouseman doesn't carry it, but certainly whoever is is uh, perpetrating the, that potential fraud. I think this this goes to what Margo said earlier too about the the uh, repetition, the mm. the comfort, right? Mm. If the inspector that flies down to the down to the Cayman Islands to go inspect for the bank shows up once a month and he does the same thing, yeah. and doesn't dive too deep, right. at what point does is is if uh, a uh, uh, you know potential thief at that point could someone that has uh, ulterior motives could say. So you got to mix it up. We, we know that uh, he's never going to go beyond just the first first layer, right? right. Uh, so one thing I wanted to ask is how often, maybe two questions, how often does commodities fraud go hand in hand with insurance fraud? Because mm -hmm. I imagine a lot of these dealers must have some insurance in place, although I did read about Mercuria, I think, which thought it had insurance, and then it turned out that that insurance was also fraudulent. Mm -hmm. um, and then secondly, <laughs> yeah. secondly, uh, just going back to your example of the steel slabs, like what happened after you discovered that? Do you start talking to the counterparties? Do you make a claim for loss? How does it all work? Uh, settling that became easy in that we went back to the facility. We went back to uh, the steel mill and said, you know, we've found a problem mm. and you are double pledged. And how are we going to rectify this? And they looked at it and they said, OK, we're going to rescind that report and republish it. And they said, 
you know, citing it was just a clerical error, which it could have been. Um, and they definitely focused on what was the more high profile, important bank that you would all know the very favored well. counterpart. Yes, who they yeah. really needed to make sure they stayed in their good graces. They said, "Don't touch that report and don't tell them anything." Yeah. Some bank favoritism so, at play. There. Yes, yes. Yeah, so the the bigger sure. one with the bigger line is mm-hmm. who got to keep the double pledged coils, and they the secondary bank got a yeah. new yeah. list. And but we did have in that instance someone on site, so we could dispatch them at any point to go out with the list and say, "I need you to verify these coils," and that's what you do. You go out and you say to the warehouse owner or the facility where it's being stored, this is the cargo I want to spot check. Tell me on your report where it is, and now let's go find it. Hmm. And that's what, you know, that's a bit of the corrective action for the checks and balances. Let's make sure there it's where they say it is and it truly exists. After Margo had identified, I think it might have been the second time that it happened because it, it wasn't just once, hmm. the larger uh, larger bank, um, it's the first time I ever heard the phrase, the de-risking team got involved and they withdrew themselves. The de-risking, uh, that's when you know you're in trouble exa- when the de-risking right? team yeah, is involved. Exactly, thought the same thing. But yeah, they, that bank wound down their involvement in that trade after wow. Margo's discovery, which was the right thing to do, it was just getting sloppy uh, you know, at that point. So. Hmm. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about uh, liquids? I um, mean, just even I started talking about the salad oil scandal. In terms, of, did anything change fundamentally after that in terms of how inspections are done? Because that was pretty clever. The oil floats to the top, water underneath. <laughs> but like, did anything fundamentally change? And are liquids still tricky to verify in some cases? Hmm. It, 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 liquids are not an area that we're involved. Yeah, in, okay. We're involved in. So take it, take it with a grain of salt, right? In this case, or or a dash of uh, olive oil. But <laughs> um, yeah, liquid um, sampling and so forth, something that we, Margo and I were both uh, ships officers, merchant marine officers, so we uh, had our time uh, learning in school about uh, taking samples in a tanker yeah. and uh, and so forth with uh, all, you know, so forth. But I, I don't think that there's anything, like, it's still the ba- same basic principles of representative samples, not just not just going to the top layer, right, yeah. but uh, doing a thorough inspection and having, uh, and also vetting of the the facility that's storing it, uh, ensuring that that facility is uh, vetted vetted properly and that the ownership and the management and the procedures are uh, are tight and intact. But the sampling, uh, physical sampling of uh, when it comes to uh, liquid commodities, I think is something that uh, hasn't changed in the past uh, few thousand Mm. thousand years. And it's just a matter of how thorough it's done and if it's Mm. done in the right way. So speaking of change, I mean, we started this conversation talking about that Mesopotamian tablet and Mm -hmm. the complaint about copper quality. Um, And it does seem like a lot of this hasn't technologically advanced. But talk to us about what is happening on that front, because you mentioned drones surveying mm-hmm. coal. I imagine ancient Mesopotamia <laughs> did not have the benefit <laughs> of drones. Right. Um, I'm certain there have been dozens, if not hundreds, of people on LinkedIn uh, pitching blockchain for, for trade sure. receivables. <laughs> that must be a thing. Right. But what kind of advancements are people talking about? Yeah, it, the the technological, as you said, right, certainly the drone the ability to use drones to measure uh, physical um, dry bulk stockpiles is, is an advancement. It gives a far more accurate um, <clears throat> accurate picture of what's what's there versus a uh, versus an eyeballing uh, an estimation, right? Which would be another form of doing that, or verifying very complicated verifying of the weight of everything that's gone into that stockpile. But that can change at any day as uh, materials withdrawn. The blockchain. Uh, and electronic uh, bills of lading, right, and, and so forth. It all helps. But what are the warehouses saying about this? Are, are they, you know, making noises about we're going to start doing things maybe slightly differently in yeah. order to avoid all we these things? Right. Right? right. I mean, the, <laughs> where is the liability hmm. and who's authenticating what that material is? If the warehouseman is merely storing it, they're saying their receipts will say said to contain. You know, oh, I I'm see. declaring. Mm. I'm so they don't wa- make a guarantee, right? I'm mm. warehousing this as copper, but I'm not a metallurgi- mm. metallurgist. I have not been part of the uh, buy and sell on this. I'm merely the guy who's building. You put this in, so I'm just saying those 24 stacks are there, yeah. and they are purported to be this. Maybe we've weighed them, and we can authenticate the weight of the units, but I can't guarantee that it's copper. Or at a different level, 
you're saying it's, you know, a certain quality and it's truly a different quality. I certainly can't authenticate that. Mm. Yeah. But there are, you know, you can certainly hire people to come in and do whatever is the right level of scrutiny for the commodity. Obviously, all commodities have different different approaches on that liquid versus yeah. hards versus soft commodities and so forth. And the warehouse can play a role in that for a hired service for whatever liability they're willing to take on. I imagine there are some commodities in which there's not much fraud, probably because it's just cheap and bulky and there's not much, I don't know, there's probably mm-hmm. much not much point in putting something fake for there's like soybeans or corn or something right. like that would be my guess. But I guess for like the ones where that are more susceptible to fraud, that t- take more time for someone to go in and do representative samples, et cetera, is there a de facto like, you know, higher risk premium that traders in these markets pay they're paying for the warehouse at the time. The warehouse has this, and you as a participant on one side of the trade uh, rent time, I guess, for the from the warehouse for that mm. inspection. Mm. Is that basically how it works? And so, like, to transact in some of these commodities, whether it's like a nickel that for reasons, because of the bags or whatever, they're valuable and not visible, like, you ultimately, like, have to pay more to transact in these commodities? It's certainly... You know, from an insurance standpoint, when you're getting an all-risk cargo insurance, which is a typical policy mm-hmm. when you're moving and storing uh, goods and commodities uh, like this, that uh, the insurance premiums are going to be significantly higher for uh, higher value goods, uh, goods like that. The facilities themselves will often look at uh, the warehousing companies' facilities will often look at uh, at higher costs for storing higher value. The, the risk is higher. The incidence of theft or higher, uh, you know, with those type of those type of commodities. So yes, uh, there is going to be more costs in dealing dealing with uh, you know with that with higher value commodities for sure. So uh, we would be remiss if we didn't also ask you while we have you here yes. uh, what's going on with the Mississippi River and the barges because the last time we spoke to you mm-hmm. I think it was back in August yeah. or September yeah. uh, there was a drought there wasn't enough water in the river and so mm-hmm. people were having difficulty getting the barges where they needed to be now we've heard some stories that there's too much water what's going on there yeah. yeah. I think the last time parties. we spoke we were we weren't even into the belly of the beast yet. It got worse before it yeah. got better. It was it was pretty epic last year, yeah. at w- what we saw, and it was what most people haven't seen in a lifetime of doing river business. It's just been that long. Uh, the river is always cyclical, and we do see drier periods, and we do see uh, periods where we get a lot of the, you know, this time of year, we get a lot of runoff from the mountains, right. from snow, and makes it way, its way all the way down the Mississippi. And so that is a classic feast or famine. Mm. And both of them present similar challenges where we have to reduce the tow size, uh, navigation is harder. And as an overall, the river just slows down and trade slows down. So can you walk through the mechanics of why does too much water cause, you cause uh, the, you know, reduced tow size? Uh, we end up with the water is moving too fast oh. in a lot of instances, and they will take down the tow sizes just to keep better controls. Huh. That's it. when you start seeing toes break apart. Yeah. Um, whereas in the fall, we were on smaller tow sizes mm-hmm. because we had to, the tow boats had to navigate little water in so many right. places. Right. They couldn't take the big toes. So and they do, couldn't be filled up as much, right? Because they would right. hit the uh, bottom. Yeah, we yeah. had to have them really, really light. And a typical uh, tow, like on the main line, uh, tow on the river would be a uh, tugboat pushing as many as like 30 barges. Yeah. So as give you a perspective, right? So reducing that from a 30 barge. Yeah. So we are, we're over that hump now. We're getting back into normal flows and more normal water size, uh, water depths. So that puts the river at a at a better speed, and we get back to some normal traffic for a mm-hmm. bit. The, uh, you mentioned, Tracy, about the the high water situation it was in the Upper Mississippi River, so north of St. Louis, like up toward up up uh, through up to Minneapolis. So mm-hmm. um, you know that'll get back to normal. But yeah, it's, it's low water, high water. Low water, high water. <laughs> Is it ever the perfect? What's the perfect level of water <laughs> in the Mississippi for the barge business? Oh my goodness. Yeah. I don't know. It happens like twice a year. So I don't know, when, <laughs> I don't know where enough. in a moment that's going to happen this year. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, Anton and Margo, we really appreciate you coming back on yeah, All Thoughts. Really Thank you so much. That yeah. was fun. Yeah. We appreciate Thank the props, too. Us. Always fun. <laughs> yeah. Thanks Th- so much. Thank you so much. That was really great. 
Uh, so, Joe, I really enjoyed that conversation. I got to say, I feel like we need to do an Odd Lots on location where we follow the guy who's yeah. flying down to the Cayman Islands to check on the gold. I love that idea. Yeah, actually do an inspection. You know what I was thinking about? And I guess it even goes back to some of our conversations that we had with Javier Blas last mm. year. Like, it's sort of like commodities seems very uncorporate. Yes. Compared to the rest of the finance industry. And this is like another reminder of that. Totally. And it's kind of weird when you think that it's the basic building blocks yeah. for so much of our world. And yet it still seems to be this sort of like, I'm going to mix my metaphors here, but swashbuckling Wild West. Yeah. Piracy, gray areas, yeah. all of these things in which like you just sort of assume that like large corporations would have like squeezed all that out. Yeah. Crime is kind of hard in many digital realms at yeah. this point, but it feels like when there's physical stuff like crime finds a way but the other thing i was thinking is it does feel like there's a sort of clash of incentives here where you want to encourage people to use the best counterparties use warehouses with very stringent risk control yeah. measures and yet that also seems extremely time consuming and expensive and bureaucratic so you could see why people might want to yeah. switch to others and i guess that also like to the original point like a warehouse like the LME, you just don't expect it to have any issues. And then that is ultimately the mental bias, I suppose, that the fraudsters take advantage of if mm. you can get in somehow into the most reputable entities mm. where people feel like oh, nothing bad is going to happen here. So you can see how it's sort of like this, like, I don't know, cat, cat and mouse game. Speaking of mental bias, you need to uh, you need to shift your take on um, the, the gold in Fort Knox and you scratching it and say you were you didn't accidentally touch it. You were checking. I was checking, You're checking was on the checking quality. And it was it was you did Everyone is service. I, I have oh, the New York Fed. That's right. For everyone, that at least one gold bar that was in the basement of the New York Fed in 1998 when I took a field trip there was real gold. Public so I, service, I, I not crime. I have done my part. I have done my part. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you for the reframe. All right. On that note, shall we leave it there? Let's leave it there. All right. This has been another episode of the All Thoughts Podcast. I'm Tracy Alloway. You can follow me on Twitter at Tracy Alloway. And I'm Joe Weisenthal. You can follow me on Twitter at The Stalwart. Follow our producers on Twitter, Carmen Rodriguez at Carmen Armin and Dash Bennett at Dashbot. And check out all of the Bloomberg podcasts under the handle at podcasts. And you can stream Bloomberg Originals on Apple TV, Roku, Samsung TV, and more. And tune in on Bloomberg TV at 10 p.m. Eastern. And for more Odd Lots content, go to Bloomberg.com slash Odd Lots, where we have a blog, we post our transcripts, we have a weekly newsletter, and we have a Discord where you can go chat 24-7 with other Odd Lots listeners. It's really fun. Discord.gg slash Odd Lots. Go check it out.